Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is a very special uh, Read to Me Heidi segment because we are interviewing our very first wonderful author and publisher, uh, S. Bear Bergman, who is the author of uh, adult and children's books uh, at his wonderful publishing company, Flamingo Rampant. And we are here today with S. Bear Bergman. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am great. I wanted to just say one, one little thing, if that's okay with you, about yeah. your wonderful company. Um, they make books that are both nutritious and delicious, fun stories, beautifully illustrated children's books that have important values like racial justice, disability, pride, and kids taking action. Most of all, having loving, positive LGBTQ plus families and communities. And that's what I wanted to say about that. So <laughs> we, uh, I know that you're, it talks about that you have an author of nine books, but on our site, we're going to be reading two of them. Amazing. Uh, yes, I know. Yeah. But the first Some one. Some of them are for grownups and not yeah. very interesting to small children. So I think you've, I think you've chosen well there. Ah, uh, well, we do have a range of uh, different ages that we'll be watching Read to Me Heidi, and it's for everybody. And because this is our Pride Month in June, it's important for us, of course, you know, to be inclusive. And I want to have books for everybody. And so not just like every month, if there's a holiday, we're going to do it for this person or do it for that person. But because this is our first official year, I do want to do that. And so speak a little bit about how Flamingo Rampant came about, if you don't mind. Do you mind me asking you that? It sounds like it's been around for a little bit now. Uh, yes, we have <laughs> been, we've been doing this for 10, um, sorry, I have sort oh, that's of, okay. I have COVID time. Problem. Yes, COVID time warp. Yes, COVID time warp, uh, and not in the fun Rocky Horror way. We oh. have been working on Flamingo Rampant now for 13 years. Wow, um, that's and you know, we got started because, you know, the, the <sighs> um, Flamingo Rampant exists in large part as a reaction to yeah. a lot of the books that existed when uh, our children started being born that were marketed as being LGBTQ 2S children's books. Right. Um, but most of the plot of them was pretty grim. It was a lot of, no, no. Yeah, it was a, you know, it was a lot of yeah. very special episode. Oh, oh, oh. This is kind of books this where is an unusual situation. Yes, your identity oh is a problem, but right. it's okay. We're gonna teach people to be all right with it. Wow. Or some kid would be exhibiting some uh gender independent or gender non-compliant behavior, right. and all the other kids would be awful to them. Like, okay, there's this children's book <laughs> called Derek the Knitting Dinosaur. No. I swear to you. I swear to you, this is real. And okay. in the book, Derek the Knitting Dinosaur, which was very popular, it came out in the 90s. Um, Derek yeah. is a boy dinosaur who knits and all of the other dinosaurs give him tremendous amounts of grief for yeah. this one gender, you know, non-compliant uh, activity that he enjoys. And then okay. the Ice Age happens. Ah, so all of the things he's, he's knitted? Yeah, and then swear. suddenly all right. the other dinosaurs are like, Derek, buddy, <laughs> how about a hat? You know, like, you're not That's okay funny. until you can be useful to us. Okay, right? you know what sounds familiar about this? It's funny, the, uh, you know, the claim, not claymation, but the action, um, I guess the uh, story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the one that they have on every year that has, what's his face singing with the guitar in the beginning? Um, my husband and I always talk about this. It's great. Well, you know, Rudolph is just this horrible person that is like banned from, you know, hanging out with all the reindeer because he has a red nose. Come on now. And they put this glob of whatever on his nose. And when it shines through, he's abandoned by his family and he goes off. He and the elf that are different that wants to be a dentist. You know what I mean? 
And then finally, when it's this big, huge storm, Santa's like, Rudolph, we need your nose. So like, it's kind of a warped thing, but the, isn't that strange? We've come like in different segments with each decade. Yeah. You know, this is why I loved your books so much because they're so fun. And um, especially, okay, so let me jump into this. If you don't mind me jumping into this, your yeah. first book. Now this, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm not assuming that this was your first book you wrote, but the first book that we're going to read, I guess, on Me to Me, Heidi, is, is that a boy or a girl? Is that for a boy or a girl? Is that for a boy or yes, a girl? Yes, yes. Is that for a boy? Not is that a boy or a girl? Is that for yes. a boy or a girl? Excuse me. Yes, yes. I meant to say for. I just don't know why that came out that way. But it is has beautiful illustrations. It's amazing. How did that uh you you it's obviously a book that talks about gender, which is so important. Mm -hmm. Was this your first book that you wrote, or were there other before this one? Or sorry to uh, ask. But in terms of children's books, children's uh, books Adventures of Tulip, Birthday Wish Fairy. Yes, we're going to be doing that one. Well. Day were both first. I I secretly love that book because I think of it as a wish fairy procedural. You know, I love that book too. what happens at Wish Fairy Worldwide <laughs> Headquarters. What right. do they serve in the cafeteria? How are okay. wishes handled? how to wish fairies travel. But the whole idea from the beginning yes. was, what if we made books where kids get to do things that kids actually enjoy? You know, right. meet a dragon, right. go to space, pretend to be a pirate, make a friend, make a mistake, make right. a mess, right? <laughs> make a mess. <laughs> well, but kids aren't yes. interested in these books like, even dinosaurs get divorced or uh, a mouse goes to the dentist, you know, they're interested in them for sort of the, the one moment in which they need validation about those things. Bye. But there's, a, okay. There's an amazing black literacy educator named Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop. And she's the one who originated the idea that for a child, every book is a mirror, a window, or a sliding glass door. Love that. That's great. Love that. The reason that everybody in children's literature talks about this is it's mm -hmm. so easy to grasp, right? That's a kid so reads a book and maybe they see a reflection of their own experience. Totally. It's a mirror maybe they see into somebody else's experience it's a window maybe it becomes a way that they move from one experience into another it's a sliding glass door Love right that. so books like even a mouse goes to the dentist are a good example of a sliding door book where a kid yeah. you know enters the experience right but nice. all of those other books about queer and trans kids and families and communities were always made that the primary job of them was nice. to be a window. We're introducing the idea of nice. two moms or two dads or gender independent kids or queer kids or whatever, so nice. that other children can understand it. Right. Right. And the narratives were always these very realistic mm -hmm. uh, situations where a kid would be really bullied or ostracized or violence would be done to them. Especially these days with everything that's going on, you know, it's just crazy. Um, in and so Flamingo Rampant exists to make books that are mirrors for mm -hmm. kids who are themselves queer or trans or gender independent or gender non-compliant or no. who live in families and communities that are LGBTQ. Right, right. right. Or and just different types of families, like that one with the bridge. That was amazing. Um, let me let me just promote this other book that you have. Bridge oh yeah, Bridge of Flowers, which is a fantastic book. Oh my yes, God. Where kids get to do magic in yeah. the dirt and their magic is so much more powerful mm -hmm. than they understood because right. they are making a helpful and growthful magic right and they're so, helping the whole family that was so cool that uh i like the way that author talked about that mm -hmm. uh, 
of course, Lee you know, I mean, Peeps Ness Samara Sinha. She's yeah. brilliant and amazing and has also a number of books for adults, which are about uh, disability justice. Her book, Care Work, Ooh, is okay. so good. Like, life-changingly, brain-rearrangingly good. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, okay, well, let me ask you one other thing. Um, what it, So I know what inspired your book um i have i have some questions here uh do you also uh do you feel that parents also have come up to you after you've written these books and they've gotten back to you with their feedback and are like thank you so much and from different communities not just lgbtq communities but like you know uh, people that are not lgbtq have they said you know because i know you live in canada and so you guys are always ahead of us i think even though we're in california it kind of goes canada california and then New York and then the rest of the states are like Meh. you know they're trying so hard to catch up to new ways of thinking and you're so I feel Canada is so advanced in some of these ways you know not just with your universal health care but just everything you know um do you feel uh is that do you get a lot of feedback with your company from um a lot of your people that read the books and everything tell me a little bit about that if that's okay oh Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do. I get a lot of email from parents. Mm. Uh, I also get a lot of messages from kids and I'm here to oh, tell you. Do. you there is literally nothing in the world better than fan mail in crayon. Oh my God. No, that's so cute. Yes. Um, but I do want to, I want to tell you a story about this actually, because yes, whatever you want to talk a, about, to it hear. was a very, it was, it was a really bolstering moment for me at yeah. the very beginning of Flamingo Rampant. Mm -hmm. So it's 2014, I'm in Philadelphia and I'm at this huge conference right. at the Philadelphia Convention Center, right? Okay. Which is enormous. Uh, and it, I was, you know, there with Flamingo Rampant at this table with our books oh. behind it. Right. And it had been a long day of talking to people and selling books and we had done well and I was pleased. Oh, great. But it was the end of the day and I was just about ready to pack it in. Right, right. And I heard, you know how, um, you know how little kids like four, five, six have these voices that can cut through any crowd like yes mommy so, yes exactly the and tone is so clarion right mm. and i hear this little voice saying <clears throat> daddy you have to come with me you have to so of course i turn and look and there is a little six-year-old girl she's got you know fancy very fine little dreadlocks and like beautiful barrettes and ribbons in yeah. her hair and she's holding on to the hand of a man who is roughly the size of an industrial refrigerator <laughs> he's like six feet five 350 pounds like professional basketball size yes man. right 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 that's crazy and she is holding his hand and she's like 45 degrees to the ground <laughs> and she tries to tow him Oh to my where gosh. She wants for him to go. So immediately I'm interested to see <laughs> what is going on because I am delighted by her determination. Right. Right. Because right. there's obviously no way that she can make him move by force. He's like but lifting her up. That's funny. It's clear that she knows she can make him move by love. And that is, in <laughs> fact, exactly what happens. He looks down at her and says, okay and she tows him by his gigantic catcher's mitt style hand oh my god right over to our table what oh my god that's great that is where great. she takes his hand and puts it right down on a copy of love is in the hair oh <gasps> which is while you're speaking oh, you I have that? the book there you go. perfect fantastic book by the way okay yeah which is a a dreadlocks love story. Right? Yes, it is. It's so girl. great. I loved that. 
Here's the back cover. It's so amazing. There you go. All the illustrators are amazing. Okay, anyway, go on with your story. It's about a little girl whose parents are at the hospital having her younger sibling. Hi. And she's excited and she can't sleep. And so her uncles are staying with her while her parents are at the hospital. And right. so she wakes them up like, I can't sleep. And they decide that they will soothe her with warm milk and stories, right? Like right. very uh, comforting when you're little. And the stories they tell her are about their relationship and their family through the objects that are braided and woven into their dreadlocks. I loved, okay, I love that. That is such a great, oh my God, it's such a great. It's super cute and delightful. So this man who yeah. is like a whole foot taller than me and, you know, and has, you know, the kind of dreadlocks that people refer to as life locks, like they are down to his waist. Oh my God, no. And she has wow. tiny, tiny little uh beautiful ones and so he picks up the book and he starts reading it and he's like five pages in and tears start to drip down his cheeks and he reads a couple more pages and he's fully crying and so i of course I'm so moved by this that i am now crying she's just standing there like I told you so. She's not, right? She's not wow. crying. But he and I are having this dad moment where we're just like, you know, about it. And he finishes the book and he puts it down. He turns to her and says, baby, you're so smart. You were right. And then he looks at me and says, I'll take 10. 10? Oh my God. And then he crazy. starts telling her who they're for. I'm going to get you oh. one. I'm going to get one for Uncle Jerry. I'm going to get one for church. I'm going to get one for school. I'm going to get one for Aunt Beatrice. These aren't the real names of the people. Right, right? of course, right. That's he's so listing great. out 10 places and families that he knows right. that he's going to buy a copy of this book for. Of course, I gave him a nice discount. Yes, of course. <laughs> but it was yeah. a moment that really, you know, up until that point, I had spent a lot of time thinking about the question of a book that is a mirror and what it means to a kid mm -hmm. if they've never seen themselves or their family beautifully, yeah. lovingly reflected. Right. right? I, Either... I remember that the people, uh, the loving couple in the story, they were talking about how they met and they had a wonderful memory in, in, in the dreadlock uh, of what Spark, yeah, of, they, of their that's wedding and of yeah, their wedding yeah. that's so good yeah oh so he bought he bought 10 okay. because he right like we'd been thinking about it in terms of you know for a lot of kids either their experience is totally absent or when it's present it's a problem Oh, right no. or it's a or it's um you know a lot of the children's books that feature black kids are about slavery yeah, a lot right. of the children's books that feature indigenous kids are about first contact or residential schools or right. you know the trail of tears right? right and so not only to be present but to be present in a way that is loving and peaceful and beautiful mm -hmm meant as much to this total stranger yeah. as it did to me. And I was like, okay, we but were, I was right. This was right. These were, this was very early in the process of actually. You had just kind of just started getting your books out. Publishing right. books. We'd mm -hmm. been working on it for a while, but these were sort of our first books that were like in the world after three years. And I had not, this was only my first time ever tabling for Flamingo Rampant and really like meeting our customers in person. Wow. And I just thought, I, okay, like, <laughs> we, we have to keep doing this. This is as important as I theorized it to be in practice. Like Dr. Yeah, because, Dr. Yeah. Bishop was right. This is real and it's very important. Yeah, no, this is, I think this is um, sometimes, okay, so I know also, this is where I'm going to say this thing. So it is important because sometimes I feel, you know, spiritually we have a purpose 
we, you know, sometimes we have dual purposes. Like you also are, you know, you're creative because you're an author, but you're also creative in a sense that you're finding other creative books as a publisher, but you're also a screenwriter. And so, you know, your creativity goes into that as well, you know, as an artist. And do you find that also doing these, I mean, obviously you have a very strong, um, idea of what's fair and just and do these also encompass your stories that are in screenplays as well I mean it seems like you've been an author an author but also a writer for a really long time tell us a little bit about that too um it's, I, you've probably been writing for millions of years but you know if you wanted to speak on that for a little bit but I have a feeling this is just like a little sidebar of a piece of you that got reflected and people are getting a chance to now have a good um impact from it so but tell us a little bit about some of your screenplays or it, I'm sure it started with stories that you wrote uh that are similar to this as well um we'd love to hear whatever that is I mean the I to be honest I really think of myself as a storyteller right uh, and I do and my one of my favorite things that I get to do is tell is tell stories is stand up in front of an audience, you know, like the moth or oh, I love the something moth. like that. And let's, let's explain to people that don't know the moth. I mean, on. The, the moth is a, the moth is it's, you know, it has multiple levels, but it's people standing up on stage and telling a true story that happened. Right. To them. right. It's a wonderful thing on NPR. It's just a yeah. great thing. That's so great. Okay. So continue. I'm sorry. I interrupted. No, no. Um, but for me, all of the things I do, writing books for grownups, writing books for children, uh, performance, screenplays, education, uh, consulting that I do, it's pretty much all just that same one talent wearing several right. different hats. Right. <laughs> and it's, and it's right. about telling stories. And so for me, storytelling has to be, for me, Right. Yes, like, yes. I don't necessarily think this is always true about storytelling, but the storytelling that I love is the kind that not only reveals things about the subject of the story, but it also reveals things to the listener about themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a kind of alchemy. You know, right. I translate my feelings into words. And then right. I send them out into the world and then they turn back into feelings. Yeah. On the other end, which is uh, wild and delightful <laughs> in every way. Mm. Um, it's great that you're a performer. It's wonderful that you also perform some of these stories too in person because it's always so great to hear the person that's like a storyteller or an author uh, tell their version in their own words of what occurred to them. And I always think it's always more powerful sometimes when the person who's written it. Now, of course, I'm an actor as well, you know, so this is how I got it. You know, I did, I do a lot of voiceover and I've always cared about children's um, issues and um, things like that. So, but besides me being an actor, but, you know, I usually take the written word and I try to put my own interpretation on it, but I always feel it's good to serve the writer. You know, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I have to make it my own. No, the writer wrote it a certain way so that it, it tells, you know, I mean, it, it's a mix of the two. It's like a vine, you know, it's the mix of the two. So you have to find a balance. But um, that's wonderful that you're also a performer. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. I feel like the the collaboration between a writer and a performer can be very rich. And I'm always... Mm -hmm. I'm always f fascinated, you know, I to know. learn new things about what I wrote, hearing someone else read them to the point when even when I'm writing, you know, nonfiction essays for for publication, sometimes right. I will prevail upon a friend to read it to me so oh, that I can cool. understand what they see and feel is is most compelling because it it and it it really sometimes helps me to understand oh i i haven't explained enough right here why this is important or oh i have over explained why this is important <laughs> right or, when there's huge or, amounts of exposition <laughs> right like i'm and every time i learn and it is my hope that i improve right. each time certainly but um but the the nature of performance is always about interpretation, even when you're performing your own work. But 
I don't know, finding what's in somebody else's words or sort of handing your own over to to a performer to so that they can find out what's in them. That's scary. Uh, I mean, uh, having the opportunity to, I mean, it's a lovely thing because it's a collaborative process, you know, to have, you've written this thing and now the director's going to take it and do something with it. And so will the actors. Is that kind of scary, giving up your baby to have other interpretations be put on top of it? Or is that just part of the whole thing you think you feel I mean it is part of the collaboration but it is it is you know started from your egg you know your seed or whatever you want to call it you know what I mean uh I think it has got I would say it has gotten less scary for me over time okay yeah mm -hmm. I think it's a I think it's a confidence question right like I, I have I have over time my confidence in myself and my ability to write something yeah. has grown. And so I feel less worried about interpretation, but also I have seen amazing things uh, yeah. in those collaborations with performers. And I think, you know, everything's a ratio, right? The first I time, if it goes well, you're one and O, oh, and if it goes badly, you're O oh and one. Mm. Right. Uh, so there's a lot on the line by the hundredth time, you know, the, even if it's not great, you can sort of recognize, okay, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't, or here's an opportunity for me to learn something, which, yeah. you know, I've had, and I guess I will also say I've been very lucky or mm -hmm. I feel lucky um in that i have had very few catastrophic failures um, okay wait yes. so on that note before we continue okay. that thought, i got a little window that said we might be running out of time so okay. may i send you another link will you please open uh, it if I send yes you sure of course okay so we are just going to now just end this one but keep that thought and i'm going to send you the link and we'll start over is that okay Fair talking enough. about my catastrophic failure yes. yeah no <laughs> talking no. about how you know don't have catastrophic failures but before it but goes I, down i thought i better should just like shh, at this one and we'll start again afresh okay so i'll see you in two seconds great thank you oh my goodness i'll talk to you soon